Cool. Thanks, y'all. Y'all hear me okay? Cool. So thanks for coming to my talk, a brief introduction to systems programming uh, with Scala Native. So about me, um, I'm on Twitter at Richard Whaling. Um, I'm a lead data engineer at M1 Finance in Chicago. More about M1 Finance in a sec. And I'm, a, I'm the author of this book, Modern Systems Programming with Scala Native um, from Pragmatic. Um, it's in beta online now, so you can get it for the ebook for about half price, and then you get updates until it's done. It's going to be done really soon. I'm finalizing it for Scala Native 0.4 uh, right now, basically. Um, so really close to the finish line and happy to get this book out in people's hands. Um, if, if you like what you hear in the talk, uh, definitely a lot more content in the same vein. Um, brief plug for my employer, M1 Finance. Um, we're based in Chicago. We're a financial services firm. Uh, we do um, basically brokerage services with free trades, partial shares, uh, custom portfolios, automatic rebalancing. So I think it's a really awesome, innovative pro uh, product. And I'd also be really happy to talk to any of y'all about how awesome it is to, to work at M1 Finance. So definitely come find me if you're interested in hearing more about it. Um, so brief outline of the talk. Um, Scala Natives moved really far even in the last five months since I last gave a talk um, at, at uh, Scala Days um, this summer. Um, so really just a quick status update on how far Scala Natives come along. And then we're going to do just sort of context and background um, on systems programming more broadly. And then deep dive into some example programs that show how Scala Native exposes the, the, what I think are the really fundamental and intrinsic techniques of systems programming. Um, so quick status update, Scala Native, um, we're on 0.4.0 M2 right now, and most people are using the milestone releases for 0.4 rather than the 0.3 series. M3 is coming really soon, and that's going to have 2.12 and hopefully 2.13 support as well. And then once that's ready, 0.4.0 uh, will happen um, very shortly thereafter. Uh, we've also um, released our official libuv bindings. Um, that's the, the, the original Node.js C library uh, for, for event looping and IO. Um, Scala Native loop. Um, and I can talk m way more about that at the unconference or, or on the side. Um, we're also trying to get cat good cats and Zio support um, for 0.4, um, really aiming for compatibility with the existing FP ecosystem and leveraging that to sort of bypass the issues around compatibility with, with Java IO. Um, that being said, this slide aside, um, we're going to just go deep into the, the lowest possible level and the, <laughs> the, the most native side of things. So to, to start, what is systems programming, this thing I, I say that the talk is about? Um, sort of my, my pithy like one-liner is it's the domain of programs that demand a mental model of the computer as a machine. Um, and maybe unpacking that's what the rest of the talk is for. But pragmatically, this means operating systems, I.O., compilers, VMs, containers, embedded systems, real-time systems. Traditionally, it's the things you do in C. Um, and traditionally, it's something you learn a little bit of school and then promptly forget and never use, because it's not especially pleasant or effective. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. Um, systems programming can be elegant. It can be fun. It can, it can be done in, in Scala, in a language you enjoy. Um, so why, why have people used C for systems programming still uh, for, for so long? I mean, yes, there's inertia, but in particular, operating systems and hardware vendors often don't give you a lot of choice in the matter. They give you libraries, and you, you have to use them, right? Um, but especially as the, we continue to sort of move into the open source era and with the rise of new languages like Rust, you're getting more and more arguments that there are, there are alternatives to, to C for systems programming. Um, I probably don't have time to go deep into them here, but Steve Klabnik, uh, a Rust uh, developer, has a great one. David Chisnell has another. Um, and basically, their, their argument is that C isn't necessarily close to the metal, per se. Um, it describes the behavior of an abstract machine, but the modern processors with branch prediction, with hyper-threading, with multi-cores, with three layers of cache are very different from the sort of virtual PDP-11 that the C uh, abstract model uh, describes. Um, my hot take, though, is that um, the, the C abstract machine is, is a feature, not a, not a bug. And that what I, what I got from learning C was this sort of intuitive understanding of how you solve problems with this abstract von, von Neumann machine. 
Um, and and what, is, what does that mean? Because that's more jargon, right? So John von Neumann, um, maybe the best mathematician and physicist of the 20th century, inventor of merge sort, and he described the, the architecture of modern computers in the first draft of a report on the EDVAC. Um, the EDVAC is this. Um, it was a, an electronic discrete variable automatic computer. Um, it was sort of proposed and designed in 1944. It wasn't actually running fully until 1949. Uh, von Neumann didn't um, actually design it. It was designed by John Mauchly and uh, Presper Eckert, and it had um, 1,000 uh, words of 34-bit wide um, ultrasonic mercury memory, <laughs> which uh, feels pretty uh, terrifying <laughs> to me, at least. Um, the, the crucial architectural distinction that, that caused it to be revolutionary is that it was the first stored program computer which could store both data and code in addressable memory. Um, there are earlier computers that are Turing complete, like ENIAC and, and Colossus, but they were patch programmed with switches and patch cables. Um, and although they, tech in, in, on theoretical terms, could compute just about anything, in practice it took two weeks to make them do even, even simple things. Um, in contrast, the, the von Neumann architecture works like this. Um, you have a, a central processing unit, and it can sort of do two different things. It can either fetch instructions from memory, um, and then it has like a program counter uh, to see where in the instructions it is. And then it also has an arithmetic logic unit that can also fetch data from, from memory and do things with the data. And the, the sort of interleaving of fetching your code that you're going to run, um, and then fetching the data that the code tells you to do things with, um, feels like a really fundamental uh, break with the, the past of, of electromechanical machines. Um, and that in particular, it's really the, the first realized um, implementation of a, a universal Turing machine, which is to say a, a general purpose computer. Um, this was the, the, the first general purpose computer that it was actually practical to construct and to, to write programs for. Um, such that within seven years of this machine being designed and two years of it actually running, um, computer scientists invented random access memory, conditional branches, go-to instructions, subroutine invocation, merge sort, of course, twos complement integer notation, Monte Carlo methods, computer music and computer games within a few short years. Um, just sort of this explosion of, of applications and discoveries um, that were enabled by, for the first time, having a comprehensible and practical model of a, of a programmable general purpose computer. Um, and then 30 years later, <laughs> dot, 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 you get, you get C, right? Um, uh, Kernahan and Ritchie. Um, and I'd argue that C still, to some extent, presents the enduring um, sort of syntactical representation of this abstract random access stored program computer. Uh, it has um, a lot of things that are thought of as, as quirks of C, right? It has a small handful of primitive data types. Um, it has these zero terminated uh, byte strings. It has arrays. It has structs. And structs are really just product types, like, like, like tuples or case classes. It has unions, which are some types, right? Um, it has pointers, and it has fun function pointers, which is to say functions as, as values. Um, and if you, if you take a, a systems programming course in college, these are all weird, arcane features of C you struggle with. Um, my hot take is that um, underneath C's punishing syntax, there's actually something very, very fundamental here. And that these seven techniques are the, the fundamental, like, meat of what it is to program a von Neumann machine in, in, in general terms. Um, so fast forward another uh, breakneck 45 years and you get Scala Native <laughs> in 2017. Um, and uh, Scala Native Write is a Scala C compiler plugin that compiles Scala programs to uh, binary executables ahead of time. It uses LLVM, the same um, compiler framework that, that Rust uses. Um, Scala Native is noteworthy for its advanced optimizer, its lightweight runtime, its GC, and its C interop layer. Um, it, it should also be pointed out Scala Native isn't a JVM. In contrast, you know, Grawl can compile JVM bytecode to machine binary, but conceptually that's actually quite different, even if the result is still uh, machine bytecode. Um, and the, the payoff for that is because Scala Native actually understands Scala, not just JVM bytecodes. 
Scala Native can provide an elegant DSL for low-level programming with all the capabilities of C. Basically, it's C embedded in Scala. Um, and if you, if you take one thing from, from this talk, that's, that's really the takeaway, and that's what led me to, fell, to fall in love with Scala Native three years ago. Um, so what we're going to do for the, the next 20 minutes of this talk is we're just going to illustrate what these fundamental techniques are, these primitive data types, pointers, strings, arrays, structs, unions, um, and, 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 and functions at the machine level. Um, with, with short Scala Native programs, um, and we'll see how far we get, um, but we're making good time. So caveat, regular Scala, very different from what I'm going to show you, works just fine in Scala Native. Um, everything you're going to see here lives in the Scala Native.unsafe API, which is very useful for library authors, but not even where ordinary application developers in Scala Native necessarily need to go. Um, and these slides are going to contain extremely imperative, unidiomatic Scala. Um, I feel a little guilty they put me on the functional track because in some ways this is about as far from FP as you're likely to get at a modern programming conference. Um, so uh, that said, let's, let's kick it off. So first off, you have just a handful of fundamental data types um, that can't be broken down into anything else. Um, these all have concrete representations in memory, and they have fixed sizes. We can get the size with the, the size of operator, which just takes a type parameter and tells you, hey, exactly how many bytes does this, this take up on, on, on disk? Um, so we'll just ask it to, to display both the value and the size of an int, a byte, and a double. Let's, um, let's actually run it really quick. Cool, so it's just telling us ints are four bytes wide, bytes are one byte wide. <laughs> oh, I really am glad bytes are one byte wide, and uh, doubles are eight bytes wide. Um, also, just pointing out that, that lovely Scala native instantaneous startup time, and how big is this binary? Yeah, nice little 1.5 meg um, binary. So that, 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 that's sort of the, the machine um, executable payoff. But I, I get more excited about the abstract model than the, the logistics of, of machine code, really. Um, so there's really not a ton of, of fundamental data types like this. Um, they're, they're all between 1 and 8 bytes. Um, note that strings right, are not a primitive in C and not a primitive in Scala native. Um, and then let's, let's keep going. So the, the, the really famous one, the, the signature one in C is, is pointers. Um, and what we have in Scala, uh, Scala Native is this type pointer, which takes a type parameter, which is sort of a nice, clean, parameterized, generic pointer type um, that I find much more ergonomic to work with than C's, you know, asterisk, ampersand, um, syntax noise. Um, but basically, a pointer denotes the address of a value in memory while being a value itself. Um, generally, what that means is a pointer is just a 64-bit unsigned integer that contains the numerical address somewhere in linear memory of where data of some, some type is. Um, pointer values in Scala Native are always created by explicit allocation. So um, there's certainly other ways to create an int, but if you invoke this built-in stack alloc function, which again takes a type parameter, that's just going to return an uninitialized pointer uh, to an int um, on the stack somewhere, um, right? And then once you have one, because again, it's uninitialized like C, um, you'll need to both um, set the value and then also get values out of it. Basically, you can think of this pointer as being a place somewhere in memory where you can store data and get it back out. Um, and the way we do this is with the dereference operator, which is um, uh, the exclamation mark or bang. And the, the interesting thing about this is it does different things depending on whether you're on the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the assignment, what you can see at lines four and seven. When you're on the right-hand side of the assignment, um, it's actually a dereference operator. It's saying, hey, go read memory at this address and return the int you, you find there. Note that I am, in fact, reading from uninitialized memory here. <laughs> um, but then um, what we can do here is that we can actually um, um, a store values into the pointer by using the, the same operator on the left-hand side of an assignment, um, and then uh, retrieve the same value back again. I think we're, we're good on time. Let's, let's do it again. It's really hard to type with um, my, the mic in one hand. Um, 
So, so about what you'd expect. We have a pointer that lives at some, you know, scary hex memory address. Um, the interesting thing is that pointers themselves have a size, right? But the size of a pointer is always eight bytes because it's just a, a long integer. Um, <laughs> that might be helpful if I'm doing more live coding, right? Good call. I might, I might switch to that. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of liking the, the, the mic like this too. Um, but because pointers are really just long unsigned integers, um, pointers are always the same size, even if they're pointing to things that are smaller than eight bytes or potentially much larger. A pointer to an array of millions or billions of bytes is still eight bytes because it's just the address. That's all there is. Um, Note that there's actually not an address of operator, the, the ampersand operator, which um, even is even um, an ergonomic improvement, I would say, over Go, which is generally a lot higher level than Scala native. Um, instead, we do require these sort of explicit allocations to, to get access to a bare pointer. Um, but, and this gives us really nice safety guarantees. It means if an object is managed by the GC in the runtime, um, it means you can't break the seal and accidentally take the address of something that is very likely to get moved or, or garbage collected or compacted away or something like that. Um, so it's actually a really nice um, difference um, to, to some of the other languages out there that, that do similar things. Um, also, if you're, if you're a FP geek, this is actually really closely related um, syntactically and semantically to the, the reference and pointer types in standard ML, which is where I sort of first learned this, and also into Haskell's internals. Um, would love to geek out about that with someone later. But in, in some ways, it's a, more pure, it's a more pure way to represent a mutable cell in memory than Scala's var versus val, right? Um, it can, it can, so it can feel a little unwieldy, but having a type that represents just a bare mutable slot um, has, has some, some benefits also. Um, so yeah, takeaways so far, all your data lives somewhere in memory, even if you can't get the, get the address of it. And it all has some fixed size. Um, some of those objects will be managed by the runtime, some won't. Um, but then once you do have an address of something, um, manipulations of that address and size are just simple arithmetic, which is very, very fast and often known at compile time, which is where you start to, to really get some performance payoff. Um, so let's keep going. Let's talk about arrays. And this is a slightly unusual um, presentation here because I don't think I'm going to show the, the, the compatibility in C array types, just because in C it's surprisingly rare to use actual arrays. And in C, it's much more common to just use bare pointers and pointer arithmetic um, as a sort of generic and portable and variable sized array. Um, and that's exactly what we're, we're doing here. We're, we're using um, the standard library malloc function to just grab an array to hold 16 integers. Um, we have to, because malloc, this is real malloc, it returns a pointer of byte. Um, in, in Scala native, we actually don't have a, point, a void pointer type. But because of that, that means we have to explicitly cast it to be a pointer of int. Um, and we just cast it with as instance of, no novel syntax there. So once we have this int array, um, we can step through it and initialize it, right? Because again, we just got it from malloc. Who knows what data is in there? And in Scala native, the, the cool thing about pointers is pointers have this sequence-like syntax this index accessor for both assignment and for, for, re, for lookups um, that's comparatively safe and unintrusive. Um, the, the really neat thing is um, it's all doing pointer arithmetic under the hood, right? Uh, just like an array in C and exactly as fast. Um, the thing that's a little unintuitive is that if you take, because, because the pointer itself has a type, because we know it's a pointer event, if you take the, the address of the, the first item and add one to it, that gives you the address at four bytes away, because when you're doing pointer arithmetic on an array, it generally knows what you want to do is move one item further in the sequence. So we can, um, we can, re we can run this one, too. Um, we're just going to initialize uh, 16 items in the array and print them out, and also verify that the result we get from using like index style accessing is equivalent to what we'd get from actually directly computing the address with pointer arithmetic and dereferencing it, because they're literally the same thing. Cool. 
Um, so about what you'd expect. It's just starting at some base address and striding through four bytes at a time and instantiating more values. Um, nothing, nothing really magic here. Um, the, the other neat thing of this is that it seek, seeks into the array or constant time, right? Which is actually a pretty hard thing to get um, on any other data structure. Um, and if you're willing to allocate a very large array, this can be very, very nice for working with sort of medium size, uh, low gigabyte scale data. Um, then let's talk about strings. Um, so how do you handle sequential data that's of unknown size or vari variable size? Um, there's sort of two fundamental ways you could go with this. One is some kind of terminating mark, uh, traditionally a zero byte. Um, the other is to somehow store the length of this variable length string um, somewhere in a sideband or as a function argument or something like that. Um, zero terminated strings were probably a mistake, but uh, they do have benefits and low overhead, right? Um, the way it works in, in, um, in Scala Native is that uh, we have a C car type, but that's actually just an alias for byte. And then we have a C string um, type that's just an alias for a pointer um, of C car, which is really just a pointer of byte. So all, all C string says is, hey, there's some bytes. And then you get some syntactic sugar for constructing C style string literals here. And that literally is just returning the pointer to the, the address where, where the data lives. So if we want to like get the length of that, we're just going to use the C standard lib string length function, which just walks through until it finds the, the zero byte. Um, it should also be apparent what can go wrong with these zero terminated strings, which is if you have an off by one error and you don't copy over that zero byte that it's looking for, string length will just walk right off the end into the rest of your program or into, <laughs> into a section of the address space that you don't have access to. Um, so this, is, this gets risky. Um, and traditionally, string wrangling in C is a huge source of buffer flow errors and security vulnerabilities. The nice thing that Scala Native gives us here um, is that the runtime gives us helper methods to convert back and forth between sco real Scala strings um, just a plain string here, basically by just handing that data over to the garbage collector and letting it become managed. And what I found is doing systems programming in Scala Native, if I just push all of my string wrangling off to the runtime, I get a huge increase in, in safety assurances, way fewer bugs, and honestly, it's not a lot slower than trying to do um, sort of wonky C string manipulation. Um, so I find this is actually also a huge, huge benefit for, for doing practical systems programming. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to go into it byte by byte. So, so quick, quick recap of the pointer. Um, so a pointer of T just indicates the address really of zero or more items of T. So it, in some ways it abstracts over the capabilities of other container types like option, like seek or string. Um, and I, I like to think of it as a sort of mutable container that represents a capability to change remote data. Um, it's profoundly unsafe. Um, seg faults, undefined behavior are all real risks here. Um, but there's also real benefits. I don't go deep into like side-by-side -side performance comparisons in this talk. But if you look at my um, Scala Days talk from last year in 2018, I do a lot of head-to-head -head, um, array crunching um, if you're really interested to see how that can impact real-world performance. Um, Let's keep going with the, the, these compound data types. I think I'm a little over time, so I'll go a little faster here. So a struct um, really is just a product type, like a case class or a tuple. Um, in Scala Native, they actually have more like a tuple-like behavior. So we declare a struct of a string, an int, and an int. And what we get is we get both a member accessor, just like on a tuple. Um, and then we also have the, the dot at accessor, which can give us the address of a member of a field member of a struct, which means you can get the member of an object without having to do an extra um, access. It's again just static pointer arithmetic computation. Um, um, you can add syntactic sugar with you know usual Scala implicits to add named um, accessors, but almost never necessary. Um, and then unions, right, are the sort of uh, low-level technique for, for managing some types. Um, what happens when you have two or more values of different types that could both exist in the same place? Um, C has unions, but 
traditionally they they were at, well they were added pretty late to the language, so it's much more idiomatic to actually just do unsafe casts between unrelated types in C, which feels terrifying. Um, but it works because if two structs have a common prefix of fields, those fields only can safely be used interchangeably. And it's really common to have a tagged union where you use the first field of an object of an unknown type to contain an enum indicating, hey, this is foo, hey, this is bar. And then you can inspect that first field, <laughs> then cast it to whatever type it actually is, even if they're of totally different values. Um, so like an example would be something like this. I don't think I can go line by line. But the idea is you can basically implement your own polymorphism, um, sort of from scratch. Um, it sort of harkens back to Greenspun's rule that all sufficiently complex C programs contain a, a, an implementation of half of common Lisp. Um, but a, a, being able to implement half of common Lisp in, in Scala is pretty cool, if you ask me. Um, so <laughs> finally, we get function pointers. Um, functions are just values in C, but they're not the sta same as Scala functions, right? Because functions are literally just the address of some compiled code in the program binary. That's all, all there is, right? It has a fixed address, it, and it, in particular, it doesn't have lexical scope, which means it's not directly interoperable either with a Scala function or even like a, a static member on a, on a Java object. Um, and then once you have that address, function call is just argument marshalling and go to. Um, it can be much, much faster than method dispatch and vtable lookups and all that. Um, and there's actually a lot of ways to fake um, lexical scope just by sort of taking a bag of data and storing it in a, in a void pointer or something like that. Um, that being said, Scala Native gives us um, this really nice C funk pointer type um, that lets us construct, in this case, it's a comparator for quicksort. Um, and a in this case, so a C function pointer is just a single abstract method type um, that has a single apply function. Um, and by constructing it this way, we actually get back a bare C style function pointer that we can then pass as an argument to, in this case, a C function, the C standard lib quicksort function. And this is where you really open up enormous um, levels of, of performance, is being able to hook into you know, the C quicksort for you know, sorting an array that's five gigabytes in, in RAM or something like that, which basically becomes impossible to even do. Um, and again, like what we're doing here is sort of, again, it's another half of, of polymorphism. It's sort of trait style uh, message, uh, method dispatch, um, but sort of implemented from, from scratch, which is both terrifying and exciting. So what are, I guess my takeaway here is that like the, the more I reflect on all this is that there's this affinity between systems programming and functional programming, right? That we have functions as values, we have some in product types, you know, way back in the lowest possible layers, um, even though we sort of can lose them in the intermediary object-oriented um, layers that a lot of modern software is built on. Um, this has really deep roots in Scala's heritage. Like, um, I learned a lot of this from standard ML originally. Um, and even Haskell has a lot of, of capabilities like this under the hood. Um, but I, what I will say is, having written a lot of this, is that Scala Native's unsafe API for me is actually easier, safer, and more productive than, than even than writing C to do the same thing. Um, it also feels more elegant than working with the OOP Java layer that Scala depends on. Um, and I think it's really a, a huge breakthrough in the ergonomics of systems programming to have this sort of consistent, compact, um, mostly type safe um, wrapper around these, these fundamental capabilities. And it's even something you could think of porting to, to other non Scala native platforms. The sun.mist.unsafe API could do this. Um, Graal could do something like this if they were inclined to. Um, and it, it just really opens up a lot of these exciting problem domains um, to a lot more people. And um, yeah, that's basically my talk. <laughs> Thank y'all. Cool. I don't think I have time for questions, but happy to talk about this uh, around, and I'll probably do a, an unconference uh, or something on Scala Native. Thanks again, y'all. Yeah, thanks so much, Richard.